With the release of Resident Evil 7, I've been on a bit of a Resident Evil kick. But today, we'll be looking at one of the non-numbered entries, Resident Evil's first transition to full 3D, Code Veronica X. It's often overlooked, but it's one of my favorites, and a fun game to talk about. The game begins with... Ah, uh, remember when games used to do this? Nowadays, they just give seizure warnings. The game truly begins with what you'd expect from a Resident Evil game. Hardcore action. Claire, one of the protagonists from Resident Evil 2, has infiltrated a base run by Umbrella, but not very stealthily it would seem. The opening is old, but still kinda cool, and has some great music and some pretty sweet action. Despite that stylish maneuver, Claire is still captured by this guy and eventually taken to Rockford Island Prison. She awakens as the prison has been attacked by some unknown force, and her captor just lets her free. How nice of him. Well, armed with the lighter, I'm sure we're prepared to handle things in this spooky graveyard. Oh yeah, this is Resident Evil. Claire is surrounded by naked zombies with the only option being to run away. Well, now we're probably okay. Ah, dang it. Meet Steve, often considered one of the more annoying characters of the series. He'll only slow me down. We'll get to more of him later, for better or for worse. The game consists of the usual pre-Resident Evil 4 gameplay. Run around, solve puzzles, grab items, and try to use what ammo you have wisely. The game is still pretty generous with the bullets early on, but you can run out if you aren't careful. Interestingly enough, the knife makes a great comeback in this installment. If you manage to knock a zombie over, switching to your knife is a great way to finish them off while conserving ammo. Instead of immediately trying to ditch it, the knife is a handy tool to keep around. Just make sure you remember to pick it up. Another thing I want to talk about in this entry is a lot of the really great setup and payoffs the game has with its situations. While running around the compound, you see a corpse being dragged under the building. If you go to the building first, you'll also receive a cutscene of something watching Claire. Return through the area later and you'll be attacked by zombie dogs. There are plenty of great setups you can expect to see later, but one of the best parts is the corridor with the metal detector. Please deposit any metallic items you have in the security box. Here you'll have to print a 3D copy of this crest. You use this alloy as the material, but you'll have to leave all your other items behind, except for maybe your herbs. Outside you can see a group of zombies, and you just know they're gonna break in, but you don't know when. Probably after I do something important. Oh boy. It's a tense moment and makes for a great scene. Past the metal detector, we see Steve checking out a computer. Claire gets the idea to try and get her brother Chris to help. No way. He won't come. You'll just end up disappointed if you rely on others. Believe me, I know. What was that all about? Took the words right out of my mouth, Claire. As you explore, it's very important that you try to examine all the environment. This will net you key items and a little more handgun ammo. Checking the items is also necessary, but I actually like doing this. It's kind of nice just to examine some of the things you find, especially the guns. One of the cool new things this time around is some of the arsenal. The dual weapons are awesome, and let you target multiple enemies at once. As you go, you'll unlock shortcuts, making backtracking easier, the usual Resident Evil formula. However, it's not always going to be safe. There are times new enemies will appear in some of the high traffic areas, so learning how to avoid fights is just as crucial. You'll also want to experiment and know which weapon works best with each creature. Handgun is great for zombies and dogs, but might not work well on large creatures. It's always pivotal that you bring the right tool for the job. After escaping the prison, Claire finds a mansion, er, palace, that seems to belong to the owner of the entire facility. After seeing a strange home movie of two creepy twins being creepy, we read a memo and find that the owner is a certain Alfred Ashford. We also find a hidden room that holds two dual Lugers, yes please. I think this may have been a mistake. Okay, keep the Lugers. Huh, lesson learned. Don't steal mounted guns. Well, time to leave, I guess. Yeah! Help me! Steve? You're the only one I know with that wimpy of a voice. And look, he decided to try and steal the guns, but it never occurred to him to just put them back. We saved Steve, but he says he's keeping the Lugers unless we trade him something fully automatic. Oh, come on, how about I trade him my knife? That's fair, right? I think he fell for it. Alright, now it's time to go. <laughs> but who is this? Who is dressed in a silly outfit? 
Who is so terrible with aiming that they need a laser sight on their sniper rifle? I am Alfred Ashford, commander of this base. Yes, one of the greatest Resident Evil villains. He claims that Claire had herself imprisoned and led the opposing force that attacked the island. Oh? You must be one of Umbrella's lower level officers if you're in command of a backwater base like this one. Oh snap! How dare you! The Ashford family is among the world's first and finest. My grandfather is one of the original founders of Umbrella Inc. Everything that comes out of Alfred's mouth is gold. Just look at how he moves here. I've never seen such emotion in our early PS2 model, but somehow Alfred pulls it off. <laughs> It your way then. You're just a rat in a cage anyway. I'll be sure to keep you entertained before I dispose of you. <laughs> well, after that, we discover a plane that we can activate if we recover the remaining military emblems. We'll also have to explore the surrounding areas to find them. Going through the game, there were some things that haven't aged well. There's no option to manually reload except for going into the menu. And with the knife, I found myself using it a lot, but it's a bit annoying to have to constantly open the inventory screen to equip it. These problems aren't too bad and would later be streamlined in future games. An improvement over previous games is how the camera has changed. While moving through certain areas, the camera will pan instead of simply switch to a different angle. This is an advantage of using full 3D environments as opposed to the pre-rendered backgrounds of the past. This is incredibly helpful as you can now walk down a long corridor without getting disoriented. We dodge a giant worm and find ourselves in a military training facility. But with the numerous shutters closed, a creature has escaped and Alfred is also trying to take you out. Consider the area you are in a special playground. Please try and keep me amused and do not disappoint me by dying too soon. I so want to enjoy this. <laughs> Alfred, you are the living end. The voice actor must have been grinning like a maniac in the recording booth. Alright, come on Claire, whatever behind that door can't be that bad. Pick up the pace. Oh look, submachine guns. With the ammo all the way over there. Pff, this is fine, we're probably safer now. Oh. What is that? That's not a zombie. And he has stretch powers. He can't get me down these stairs. Now he jumped down the stairs. After one vicious knife fight later, we dispose of the new enemy. The Bandersnatch, as the creatures are called, are one of the weirder looking monsters in the series. They're very dangerous as they can move quicker than a zombie and move through terrain with ease. Though they do look a bit silly with their yellow skin and strange proportions. Oh, wait a second. Yellow? Odd shape? Yeah, the Bandersnatch is the final evolution of the minions. Despicable Me 3 is going to be going down a creepier route. Steve helps Claire take out another Bandersnatch, and she trades him the submachine guns. Now this is my kind of weapon. All right. Huh? <laughs> oh snap! The two share a moment as they grab the ammo together. And while you don't get to keep the guns, you do get to play a play segment as Steve and mow down zombies. So if you check his items, you find a family photo. You see? This thing is a lot more reliable than any person. Than people? Steve. What were you doing here? Who brought you here and where is your family? Shut up! I don't want to talk about it! Steve, this is an evil. Don't waste ammo. Watch where you point that thing, man. Steve has no respect for gun safety. Claire gets stuck under some debris while a zombie draws near, but when Steve moves in to shoot it, he realizes it's his father. What's wrong, Steve? Shoot him! Wait! I... I can't! No, Steve, you can! I believe you can! To protect Claire, he pulls through and shoots his father. Okay, that joke is a bit overused, but it's better than what he did say. Father! 
we learned that Steve's father was an employee for Umbrella who would sell off valuable information. The company found out and killed Steve's mother while sending him and his father to the island's prison. Naturally, he's a bit ticked off at his dad for that. I think Steve's backstory is kinda interesting, and there are some good ideas here. A cocky kid who tries to act tough to hide his trust issues isn't bad. But this is Resident Evil, and writing isn't its strong point. But I do applaud the effort, and while I find Steve kinda dumb, I don't find him too annoying. Another standout moment from this game is when you explore the doctor's offices. You gain entrance to it from behind a guillotine and slowly find more and more evidence that the doctor tortured the prisoners. When you move past the morgue, you see this. You come back later and find the doctor a zombie, fight him off, and then you can take his key. And then you get to find even more of his torture devices. All this culminates in a poison room puzzle and finally grabbing the puzzle item you need. And then you never come back. Well, guess now we're done with that backtracking. Just head back to the palace and... Greetings! You must be the lovely Claire Redfield. Who are you? Wesker? Turns out he attacked the island while working for a different organization. It's never stated in-game, but he worked with HCF Hive. What is it? Stay there. I'm coming. I'm going to let you live a little longer. Wesker got bounce. This is a favorite moment for me as Wesker was thought to be dead up to this point, but I guess the title screen kind of spoils that twist. Through the palace, we find a secret passage that leads to a private estate. It's filled with a dark atmosphere, spooky music, and also bats. Lots of bats. We also find the other Ashford twin, Alexia. Do not worry, brother. I will handle them both myself. Who is there? Is someone at the corridor? What is it, Alexia? N nothing. I believe I must have been imagining things. As Claire continues to explore, she finds memos and clues about how important Alexia is to Alfred. We also get to see this ant theme that seems to run through the house, and the theme of two siblings. Also check out this contraption. I guess the Ashford twins are practical jokers. Going to sleep? Too bad! Crushed to death! And quick note, what is that giant statue thing? I guess it's just there to be creepy. Climbing the ladder will take you to this admittedly creepy children's room. You find the final military emblem needed for the plane, along with a journal entry revealing that Alexia is a genius and apparently was accepted to work with Umbrella at the age of 10. Pretty impressive. Claire Redfield, hold it right there. We get into a fight with Alexia, but Steve shows up and wounds her. Into the next room and we find... a wig and dress? This must be... What? No! It, it... Wait a second. What just happened? Yeah, that was a lot to take in. Turns out the real Alexia was never here, and in his loneliness, Alfred tried to play the role of two people. What is it, Alexia? N nothing. Also, he's really good at throwing his voice, I guess. You can even see a bit of foreshadowing to this, as Alexia's room has a broken mirror, and Alfred has a female mannequin in his. Okay, that's it. Let's get out of here. Zombies and mutants are okay in Steve's book, but cross-dressing is where things get scary. Let's get out of here. The self-destruct system has that been freak! Activated. He's trying to blow us up along All with the entire facility! Evacuated. Always with the self-destruct sequences in these games. And Metroid too. The duo prep the plane whilst Alfred is caught in some sort of in-between personality. This is what you get for trying to oppose me! Now feel my revenge! <laughs> he readies his tyrant, which is naked of course. When it attacks, it goes down pretty quickly, so yeah, a bit of a flop, that tyrant. The plane takes off with no flight complications, but apparently Alfred is prepared for this too. Hey! What the- The cargo room patch is open! I'll go back and check it out! Oh no, can't be him. He doesn't have fingers, how could it be- Oh yeah, yep. It's the tyrant. 
What follows is a tough but cool battle. You dodge the tyrant's attacks and avoid getting knocked out of the plane. You have to activate the cargo and try and send him flying out instead. It's easy to mess up, but there was an item box and save from right before this. Nothing. Just a giant cockroach that had to be stepped on. I probably shouldn't ask. Turns out the plane has been redirected to a new Antarctic base via autopilot, and the two take a well-deserved nap. Weird to see a Resident Evil character sleep. I just assume they run continuously and eat handgun ammo. What is with this music here? Like, most of the music is pretty on point, but like, this sounds like we're advertising cereal or something. Steve? Steve, what are you doing? Oh, thank god. That was awkward. That's... the Antarctic. We're over the Antarctic! And we're not dressed for this! After a perfect landing, we get into the base. No, this doesn't call for the romantic music, this is just kinda weird. As you can see, they're trying to go for a romance with Steve and Claire, and it's not handled very well. They've spent at least a day together, saved each other's lives, they do have a bit of an emotional connection. But a romance is not something I feel that is necessary, just a companionship would be good enough. The Arctic base is a pretty interesting location. When you get there, the power is off and there is no music. You're exploring in the dark with only a few ambient sounds. When you do turn the power on, you get the usual Resident Evil ambient music, but it's still kinda chilling. Even with the lights on, you still aren't safe. Another great thing is when you open a secret passage in a safe room and find this. Looks like someone's keeping a Silent Hill monster in the basement. And he's always back there, occasionally screaming. This is the safe room, right? So in this space we find some annoying moth enemies that poison you, but the cure is also right in the room, so that's weird. But we also find a digging machine and info that there's an observation base nearby. We should be able to use the machine to escape, as long as we're careful and- Ah, dang it, Steve. Getting distracted by musical cues. We've got to shut off the gas. If we split up, we'll have a better chance of stopping it. Yeah, you've helped enough. The machine gets fixed, but Alfred shows up, only to be taken out pretty quickly. It'll be fine. And then we get a cutscene of the basement creature getting free. Also, what's up with that massive medieval axe there? The two get out as the base begins to flood with water. Well, I see nothing going wrong. Uh-oh. Ah, dang it, Steve. Meet the being referred to as Nosferatu. And now he looks even worse. This is one of my favorite Resident Evil bosses, if not just for the atmosphere, design, and music. He's not too tough, but there's just something about running to the other side of the building and just waiting as he comes into view. The snow and fog also help remind me of Silent Hill, along with how crazy Nosferatu looks. After defeating the boss, we make sure to help Steve up, as he apparently has the strongest grip in the world. Well, I guess our heroes are home free. Got themselves a vehicle and everything. So, how's Alfred doing? Oh... Alexia, you're finally awake. 
Can you say Alexia without making it sound weird? Uh, Alexia. Okay then. Poor Alfred. I mean, he is an awful person. But he was such an entertaining person. I actually kind of feel bad. Uh, what is that? Looks like a giant. So, uh, did we win? Is that it? Credits? No, because we still have one more character. Chris Redfield arrives on the island to rescue Claire, but just missed her. This time, the prison has been destroyed, so exploring it will be different as the layout has changed a bit. Some areas are incredibly damaged, and there are a few rooms that are even connected now. And we still have Wesker. Chris, oh little fishy, come see my hook. Majorly inappropriate, dude. The island now has these machines that will summon the hunters, classic Resident Evil monsters that are fast and tough to slow down. Good thing we have a shotgun. Why do I always fall for that? In the earlier version of the island, Claire ran to the experimental youth albinoids, but in order to find a key item, we'll have to fight a fully grown albinoid. And the music is awesome. dramatic, heroic, and only plays for this boss. So it's a shame that you don't need to fight it and just grab the item and go. Still good music though. <laughs> Long time no see, Chris. What are you doing here? I came for Alexia. <gasps> oh snap, Wesker got Dragon Ball Z powers. Look at that smirk. Dated graphics, yes, but little details like that are something I love. Wesker lets it slip that Claire's in the Antarctic, and that he's been hired by an organization to go and grab Alexia there. Speaking of which... <laughs> Alexia? Why'd that happen? Alexia shows up on screen to laugh, then Wesker gets distracted and releases Chris. Did she just want to compare his laugh to her laugh? I mean, you're both beaten by Alfred. No contest. <laughs> Chris finds another jet, guess there's a few down there, and flies to the Arctic base that looks not unlike a still image. And immediately we find giant tentacles. That's always a good sign. The Arctic base is similar to the prison in the fact that the air has been drastically changed due to the flooding before. There are also plenty of unexplored rooms that we can now access. One such area being... Man, these games love their mansions. Chris finds Claire, but she was poisoned during the encounter with Nosferatu. Also, she is stuck in goo for some reason. Curing her will be our primary objective. While running through the frozen base, there are some neat little moments. One being where you find the hive that Alexia has created, and another where you find a giant spider under the ice. It doesn't do anything, just quietly follows you around. Better dance to throw it off. If I could throw a complaint at this game, it would be that there's a little more backtracking in this section than I would have liked. But for some reason I forgot I could use this lift thing, so that would have made things quicker. <laughs> Alexia. That is how I dispose of insignificant bugs. Said the spider to the fly. How do you wish to die? <laughs> spider, what do you mean? Oh dear. Well, have some non-specific cure, Claire. Here we see Chris helping out his sister, but the two don't get many interactions between them. It's a shame because there could be some good comparisons between them and the Ashford siblings. The two get separated after a tentacle attack, and then... Chris! Uh. No! Sounds like Steve could use some help. We get control of Claire again, and this takes us through a great and terrible moment. You find this keycard that has been encased in plastic, so to get it out, you have to have it crushed. Those Ashfords always playing practical jokes. Jokes that crush you. Now keep in mind the classic save system of having to restart from your last save, and this trial and error moment can be pretty annoying. We find Steve in a dark hallway filled with suits of armor. He's in the same setup as Nosferatu was. Who did this to you? 
that crazy woman. She's completely insane. Uh, Steve, you okay? Uh, Is it heartburn? Are you playing the air uh, guitar? What? Oh boy, he's turning into the Hulk. No, wait! Oh, that's what that axe is for. The next scene is an intense escape, which has some problems. Steve attacks very quickly and for so much damage that he can kill you in just a few hits. You'll need plenty of healing items to get through, so pair that trial and error scene with the last one and you've got a pretty annoying moment. I was able to get through it okay, the grenade launcher can slow him down a bit and that'll definitely help. Claire gets behind the gate just in time, but Alexia grabs her with a combat tentacle. Steve is about to finish her off, but is able to regain control of his mind. and dies from getting shoved. Okay, that thing is probably pretty strong, but most tyrants take a bit more to kill. Steve is the tyrant with the best hair though, mostly because none of them have hair. Oh, Steve. You're warm. Steve. You've got to hang in there, okay? Uh, my brother's come to save us. We're getting out of here. Yeah, okay, that's great and all, but what about Alfred? I'll always remember you, Alfred. Meanwhile... <laughs> At last, I've found you, Alexia. Come with me. <laughs> You're responsible for the creation of the T-Veronica virus. And now the only existing sample is in your body. I want it. Now! Come on, give it here. You want it? You are not worthy of its power! Alexia, uh, you're on fire. Literally on fire. Ew, a naked lady. Chris just watched him from behind the pillar. He doesn't want anything to do with that. Also, Alexia has flammable blood. That sounds impractical, but it looks kinda cool. Also, props to this game for having surprisingly good fight scenes. The Alexia fight isn't too bad, but boom, Magnum. Always bet on Magnum. Well, time to go. We meet back up with Claire, but to get the doors unlocked, we'll need to activate the self-destruct system. This will release all locks and give us a chance to escape. The code to start the countdown? Well, I'd say it's pretty easy to guess. Ew, I don't like the look of that. Now I really don't like the look of that. The two activate the linear launcher, but Chris has to hold off Alexia before the locks release. And then, Alexia activates her final form. It's about what you expect from Resident Evil Final Boss, but kinda worse. The music that plays is awesome, but these annoying minion leeches, uh, I can do without. After the linear launcher releases, she moves into a faster form. It'll only take one shot to take her out, but she's a tricky one to hit. Ah, dang it, Wesker. Claire! No! <laughs> Chris is surprised, but not too bothered by zombies after what he's had to deal with. Chris ain't got time for you, fool! We get to Wesker, and he tells us that he was able to take Steve instead of Alexia, as he was infected by the same virus. Maybe he'll come back alive, just as I did. Yeah, Steve is kind of lost to a classic Resident Evil plot hole. Will we ever see him again? Probably not, but I'm not against it. Wesker and Chris do get out in another battle that is surprisingly fun to watch, but the two decide to call it a draw for now. Until we meet again. <laughs> oh, 
oh crap, that explosion was close, I'm going home. The flames consume all of Alexei's work, and Chris... Barely makes it out. Chris! Hey. That always cracks me up. And so ends Code Veronica. It doesn't reinvent the series, but it's a fun little bit of Resident Evil cheese. It has some great moments, some phenomenal villains, and a fantastic soundtrack. This was the last game before the remake came out, along with Resident Evil Zero, as the last games to follow the classic formula. It's a favorite of mine, and hopefully you can see why. Well, that was a long one. Thanks for watching all the way through. If you got like any other good ideas for other games I can talk about, just go ahead and leave it in the comments. Oh man, that was that was a long one, but it was worth it for that special someone.